I've never had this opportunity before. Um, someone last week gave us a brand new Toyota. I was like, we don't need it, so let's pass it on to somebody who might need it. And I was like, I don't even know how to figure out who to give it to. I don't want to show any favoritism. So, all right, God, this one's in your lap. So here's what I did. I put a copy of the title in multiple places in the room under a chair. So if there's a white envelope anywhere under a chair, I just figure the first person to find it and wave it at me gets the, the new Toyota. So I'm just saying, this is oh, right there. Amazing, right there, Bree, congratulations, that's, wow, that's amazing. Tell you what, see me after the service and I will, we'll, we'll get that new Toyota to you. Actually, let's do it right now. Matt, you got the Toyota? So in that envelope, there's a title to a brand new Toyota. Congratulations, woohoo, let's give her a round of applause. Confused you are. <laughs> I've been waiting all morning to say that. All right, just so you say, I never gave you anything, all right? There you go, all right. A Toyota. That's just mean. I did that in last service. The person who won it, she was her second week with us. <laughs> I was like, oh. She laughed. Um, that's good, right? Well, here, here's why I did that. Um, today, we're going to talk about this parable that Jesus told, and it's a parable about a treasure. And Jesus' parables, when he, Jesus tells parables, there's short stories that are designed to stick to the soul that'll be unforgettable. Like, you're not going to forget that one anytime soon, neither are you. I mean, you're going to remember what we just did because I just wanted to give you an experience that might stick to your soul because the story Jesus tells is about this unbelievable treasure, way better than a Toyota or a Toyota car. He tells us about this treasure, and here's what's interesting. He doesn't even tell us what to do with the treasure. He doesn't tell you to go look for it. He doesn't tell you to search for it. All he says is, there's this unbelievable treasure in the kingdom of God. And he understands, like, if you know how valuable it is, you'll figure out how to search for it. And so, here we are. If you have a Bible, open to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 it doesn't matter if you got a paper Bible, digital Bible, just open a Bible. Grab the Bible in front of you. So here's Jesus' story. It's very short. It says this. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. All right, so not a trick question. What's the treasure? The treasure is... The kingdom of God is what it says. God's presence with people. I mean, Jesus is coming. Jesus is telling the story to a group of people. Jesus is inaugurating, bringing in the kingdom of God. Now, that might sound like a lot of church words to you. He's making God available. His presence, his relationship, making his family available to all kinds of people. That's what Jesus is doing. And he says, the kingdom of God, this relationship with, with, with God that I'm making available to you, it's this unbelievable treasure, more valuable than you will ever know. So he tells this story about it. Now, we got to make sense of this real quick. When you read parables, here's how people go sideways, and they get the wrong meaning of a parable. They try and look at every little feature of the parable and go, oh, so, so what does it mean that he hid it? You know, he buried it in the ground again, or, or what does it mean that he sold all that he had? And they try and make everything in the story have a point to it. You know in parables, almost every single parable has one point. Just, just one point. And so what's, what's the point of this parable? Well, all he's saying is this. The kingdom of God is of unbelievable value. Let me give you an example real quick of what happens when people start trying to make a big deal about everything in the parable. Um, if I made a big deal about the fact that, well, he, he sold everything he had and purchased the field. See, Jesus is really saying, you can buy the kingdom of God. For $399 today, you can purchase the kingdom of God. Well, okay, well, no, that's not true. Well, what if the meaning of the parable is like, well, he, it was a treasure that was hidden in the ground, right? Maybe what he's trying to say is that this treasure that's hidden is like the kingdom of God. See, God's actually hiding from you, and you have to go find him somewhere. 
Maybe that's what this means. Um, maybe what this means is, you know what? Hey, listen, if you find any kind of treasure out there, just make sure you hide it. Don't tell anybody about it. Then get enough money to purchase the land that it's on. In the first century, this was totally common. I'll explain why. Um, in the B.C. era, it was totally common that you would go into, um, the, the, there's no bank for you to put your money in. So how do you keep your money safe from thieves? And how do you keep your money safe from invaders from another country who will come in? You bury it. And hopefully you remember where you buried it, right? Um, there's actually a story of a guy by the name of Ephraim Stern. He's a, he's a, a professor, archaeologist, and he's a, of biblical studies. And so he's doing a dig south of Haifa, right on the Mediterranean coast, just northwest of, of uh, Jerusalem. And in 1995, he found this jar buried under a structure, it's buried under a structure because whoever lived in the structure buried it under their house. He unearthed it in 1995, and when they finally opened it up, 20 pounds of silver. It's pretty amazing. You're like, some of you are going to be digging in your backyards tonight. The point of this whole thing is simply this. Um, Jesus is saying the kingdom of God has unbelievable value. And he's not telling you what to do with it. He's just letting you know, here it is. The point of the kingdom of God, this relationship with God, is it has immeasurable value. And by the way, it's just kind of like this dangling story out there. But Jesus doesn't leave it dangling for long because he tells another story immediately. And it's the same kind of story. A couple different characters. It goes like this. Again, the kingdom of God is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and he bought it. Second parable, same point. Now, it's interesting because there's a couple different features. In the one where the field is there and he stumbles across this thing, he's not actually searching for anything. He just finds it. And this one with the pearl, there's a guy out there that's actually looking for it. I think that's pretty encouraging for us because, listen, some people, they're not looking for the kingdom of God at all. And they're going to stumble upon it. Maybe today you're going to stumble upon it. And there's other people who are looking for purpose in life, and is there a God? And there's, they're on this search. Whether you're searching for it or you're just walking through life, listen, the kingdom of God is going to be found by people. And when I first read this story, I thought, you know what? The thing that they have in common is both of them sold everything they had and came and purchased either the pearl or the land that the treasure was in. I was like, you know what this is about? This story is about sacrifice. Sacrifice everything for Jesus. When you figure out, you know, the kingdom of God, relationship with God, just sacrifice everything for it. Um, and then it hit me. The guy in the, that found the treasure in the field, what was his attitude when he went and sold everything? In his joy. If you ask the guy who found the treasure in the field that, hey, you had to sell everything in order to buy the field, would he go, oh yeah, yeah, it was just the right thing to do, you know, it's a treasure, it shouldn't be there, and I really wanted it, so I, it, it's a sacrifice, somebody had to do it. No, 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 he wouldn't say that at all. He'd go, woo, I'm lucky. And do we feel that way? When we hear about the kingdom of, of God, when we hear about this, this unbelievable treasure, do we go, how unbelievable lucky am I that I get it? So it leads me to this question. The question is this. So how's the kingdom of God valuable? What is the value of the kingdom of God? If you and I stumble upon it in the scriptures, if you and I are searching for it, what value is the kingdom of God? Because apparently Jesus understood it as something of amazing value. So here's where we're going to be at this morning. I'm going to give you four ways that the kingdom of God or the gospel is valuable to us. And I'm going to use the term gospel, okay? The kingdom of God, God's presence with us, his family with us, his accessibility to us. But Jesus often used the term the gospel, which simply means this. Ready? Simple. Good news. It's just really good news to us. And he says, I'm going to share some good news with you. So what is that good news about God's kingdom that has so much value to us? And here's the first thing. It's this. The gospel is a treasure because it offers, first and foremost, forgiveness. Write that in. It's in your notes right there. Forgiveness, which means we no longer carry the weight and eternal consequences of our sin. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Dr. Frank Meza. Frank was an amateur runner 
who took up running marathons uh, pretty late in his life. He started running marathons around age 60. All right? That still sounds really old to me. By the time he reached the age of 70, supposedly he was turning in times on his marathons sub three hours. I ran a marathon one time in my life. I ran an amazing 18-mile race. The problem is it's 26.2 miles. The last eight were brutal and ugly. Um, so I was, I was trying to calculate on the time that he ran the LA Marathon this last spring. Two hours, 53 minutes, and 10 seconds. And if I calculated that out, how fast he, ran, he had to run each mile, he'd have to run them in six minute and 30 second miles. And I was thinking like, let's do some research on that. So I went to the track last week. It was really, really hot. It was like 110 in San Jose. And it was like the middle of the day. And when I ran this, I had a stiff headwind all the way around. Think about that for a minute, okay? So I ran the mile, just one mile, as fast as I could. Six minutes and 15 seconds. Faster than a 70-year-old man. And I wanted to throw up. Here's the problem. Um, when he broke the record for his age category of men between 70 and 74, he broke the record by more than an hour. So some people were crying foul. There's no way. So an investigation went in and video showed him leaving the race course. And it doesn't show him where he came back in, but he swears that, no, I... I just went off to relieve myself off the course and came right back on and kept running. So they stripped him of his, uh, his world record, and um, he pretty much got bashed, bashed on social media. And I don't have to explain that to you, right? People will ridicule and be unbelievably mean. Um, so that was just this last March. On July 4th this year, they found Frank Meza's body in the L.A river. Apparently, he took his own life. Some people say, oh, it's because of the bullying on social media. And maybe, I mean, that's a pretty big weight to carry. Other people said, no, 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 he couldn't deal with the dishonesty of his own life and carrying the weight of that. Now, regardless of either one, that man carried an unbelievable weight that he decided he couldn't carry anymore. But listen, listen, you and I are no different than him. I pray to God you never get to that kind of desperation, ever. But you remember what it was like to carry the weight of you said that and it was evil and it was wrong and it was mean or you did that thing and you knew it was wrong and, and, and you went ahead even though you, you shouldn't have and, and you did that act, you hurt that person. You, I mean, you made a decision in your life and you broke something. And you carried the weight of that. And as you carried the weight of that, just you know what it's like to carry that, don't you? And by the way, that's what some of, what some of you came to church for. Like, you're like, I just can't do this. I, I can't carry that kind of weight anymore. It's like, it's wrecking me. It's eating me up inside. Physically, I'm having these symptoms and signs. And like, I just, I just can't. And maybe for some of you, honestly, hear me in this, hear me in this. Maybe for some of you, this will be the first day that you actually leave that here and you don't carry it with you anymore. Because what's so great about the kingdom of God is forgiveness. That you don't have to carry the eternal consequences of your sin. And you don't even have to carry the weight of it anymore today either. But a lot of people do, but they don't have to. So what's so great about the gospel? It offers us forgiveness. And in the midst of this same idea of forgiveness, Jesus approaches um, his disciples. And he's having dinner with them. In 24 hours, he would be killed and nailed to a cross, but he's having dinner with them, and he picks up a cup, and he holds it up, and it's a cup of wine, and then he speaks these words to him. He says, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the, here it is, for the forgiveness of sins. And I'm sure his disciples were like, what? 
that wine is actually your blood or it symbolizes your blood and you want us to drink it and he passes it along and everybody drinks it. Like, they didn't know until later when Jesus would die on a cross that he was dying as a substitute for our sin to pay the penalty for us so that we could be forgiven and we don't have to carry the weight of our brokenness. And so that's what's so great about the gospel. And let me just explain. In our church, this is how we, we do this thing. There's tables around the room, and uh, at these tables there's some bread, and there's a little cup of, of juice. And um, we invite anybody from our church who's in the service with us, you can go to those tables anytime that we're singing. In the beginning, in the end, and you can grab a piece of bread that symbolizes Jesus' body that was broken, and you can grab a little cup of juice, and we invite you, eat that. It's not the actual body of Jesus, it's bread. It symbolizes his body. And then we actually invite you to drink that. And as you do, to be thankful for the forgiveness that he's given you. And by the way, if there's something in your relationship with God that is sideways, or, or in your relationship with other people that is sideways, and there's some wrongdoings that have confess those things to God in that moment. And so here's what I would say. If you're with us, the only requirement is this, is that you're a follower of Christ. Because when Jesus says, hey, do this in remembrance, like you can't do it in remembrance if you've never received it in the first place. And so let me just say this. If you're new to our church, but you're a Christian, you're a follower of Christ, because you've received this forgiveness, this good news, this gospel, this kingdom of God that you're now a part of, you're totally welcome to join us during our worship services when we do this. And for some of you, you're so relieved right now. You're like, yeah, I never figured out. Like, I'm new. And at the end of service, people just get up and walk around the room and start taking hors d'oeuvres. It's weird. That's what they're doing. And so, um, what's so great about the gospel? The gospel is a treasure because it offers forgiveness. The second thing it is, it offers love. God offers us a friendship that we don't deserve. I'm going to read to you something from uh, the book of Titus. It's this really short book, but in these verses, it is just saturated. This, the verse I'm going to read you is just dripping with all kinds of theology and rich understanding about who God is and the friendship that he offers with us. It reads this way. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we have done. Pause for just a minute. He saved us because of his kindness because of his love, and not because of the righteous things we've done. Not because, man, you did things so great, and man, you, you made God proud, and you did all the right things, and man, you really earned God's approval. No, 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 no. None of us can earn our way into the great kingdom of God. It goes on to say this, not because of the righteous things that we've done, but because of this, his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. If I could encourage you sometime this week, go to your own Bible. Maybe you don't have your own Bible in front of you right now, but I want you to read this through and just soak this in, underline parts of this, and circle things that are meaningful. As you do, you'll start looking at it's really God's kindness and love that he's offering. That's the basis of our friendship. It's not based off of how good I am, but it's based on his mercy and grace. Because when he sees us, he knows we not only need forgiveness, but we need a relationship. And the only way that humanity can have friendship with God, a holy God, is to be forgiven. And then that text says, justified freely. Listen, free to us, not free to Jesus. (laughs) Justified, pronounced innocent. It wasn't free to Jesus. After he told them, this cup, it's a symbol of the the blood that will be shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. He would be nailed to a cross, beaten, scourged, whipped. He would die there. And to prove that he wasn't just anybody dying, he comes back to life three days later, seen by hundreds of people. Jesus, when he's um, with his disciples the day before, at that same dinner where he raised a cup, John writes down and records one of the things Jesus said. Listen to this. John 15, 14, he says, you are my friends. Think about that for a minute. Can you imagine Jesus looking you in the face and just going, listen, you are my friends. You're my friend. You're my friend. You're my friend. He doesn't stop there, though. He says, you're my friend. 
if you do what I command. Oh, what do you mean? Like 100% obedience? No, 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 no. What's this category we're talking about? Love and friendship, right? You're my friend. If we have an authentic relationship, not this fake one, not where it's just word alone. Oh, yeah, hey, hey, yeah, my BFF, we're good, right? And we don't talk to him ever again. No, authentic friendship. He looks at his disciples and says, you're my friends. We've been together for three years, but you're my friends if you do what I command. Jesus offers us this relationship. Did you know this, um, the world database of happiness? You know that that exists? The world database of happiness. It's actually a scientific uh, website where they try to measure what makes people happy. You know what's at the top of their list? Relationships. One of the things they quote is it says a major study following hundreds of men for more than 70 years. And they found that uh, found the happiest and the healthiest were those who cultivated strong relationships with people that they trusted to support them. Our lives were designed to be in relationship with people and relationship with God. Christians, honestly, should be the happiest, healthiest people we know. And I'm not sure that's always true. You know why? Because I think some people... This is going to sound bad, but I think it's the truth. Are Christian in name alone. And they don't actually know, have this authentic relationship with Christ. And know what he invites you to do and, and, and know his commands. Because if we did, we would know the unbelievable value of the kingdom of God and what it is that he has invited us to. He's invited us to forgiveness and to real friendship. An authentic relationship. Here's the third thing. The gospel's a treasure because of this. It offers, it offers new life. I believe this. That new life is that God heals and he renews our heart and our character. Every single one of us, we're, we're looking for change. Change of habits, change of traits, change of characteristics that, that are all about us, but they're broken and we know it. By the way, that's what brought a lot of people to church. Listen, something in my life is broken. Something in my life isn't right. I need new life. I need something to change. And maybe it's this. Maybe it's insecurity. Maybe it's sadness. Maybe it's a tendency that you have to, you fill in the blank. I'm sure you could probably come up with three things. You know, you have a tendency in your life to fib, uh, be selfish, um, fantasize, uh, cheat, uh, embellish. I mean, I, I, I don't know. We all have those, don't we? You're looking at me like I'm the only one. Okay, thanks. Appreciate that. There's a scripture here that talks about this new life. It's in Romans 6, 4. It says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We were therefore buried with him through baptism. Um, here's how we do it at Church on the Hill, all right? Uh, up behind me, see that screen? We lower that at some of our services, and behind that is a hot tub. It's also known as a baptismal, all right? That's the religious term for hot tub, because it's weird to say, welcome to our church, we have a hot tub. Um, inside there is just kind of a, a large pool and water in it. And when someone says, I am forgiven by Jesus because he paid the, the penalty for my sins, I want this, not just forgiveness, but I want relationship with God. I want that love. And we go, okay, that's fantastic. You are committing yourself to follow Christ. Jesus said, believe and then be baptized. And so this is a, a, a ritual, a symbol that's been around for thousands of years. And so here's how we do it. Someone who says, you know what, I'm a Christian. I want everybody to know. I believe and then I get baptized. So we stand up there with them. We ask him, what do you believe about Jesus? And, you know, just ask him a couple questions. Do you believe Jesus is God's son? Do you believe he died on the cross for your sins? He was resurrected back to life? And you're committing to follow him for the rest of your days? Yes. And this scripture says you bury him in baptism. Not a trick question. What do you bury? Things that are dead. See, fantastic. Um, way sharper than our first service. Way to go. Uh, you bury things that are dead, Right? And so we, we take that person and we, we tilt them backwards and boom, we bury them. We don't leave them down that long though, okay? <laughs> we, we bury them because it's the symbol of this. You are burying your old life. My old ways of living, my old ways of me being in charge, my old ways where I have a tendency to dot, dot, dot. Buried, dead. I'm not committed to that old life anymore. And we put them down 
And most of them we bring up quickly. There's a few I've held down a little bit longer. Just put them through the spin cycle. And, and then we bring them back up. Why? It's the death of their old life and the resurrection of their new life. And they do it in front of people because they need to know that they're telling you, my decision to follow Jesus is always personal but never private. I dare you to find a conversion to Jesus that is private. No one ever knew it, but I, I had this personal encounter with Christ and I gave my life to Christ. I became a Christian. It's never a private thing in the scriptures. It's always a communal thing. You let people know. And so at our church, we baptize people. Death, the old life, resurrection to the new life. Why? Because for you to step into a new life where God is changing your heart and changing your character, you need the other people around you to support you so that they know. You'll never forget the day that you stood in that baptismal with somebody and you were put down to your old life and raised to new life and came up looking like a drowned dog in front of everybody. And they cheered for you. Because you had this new life in Christ. What's so great about the gospel? What's so valuable about that treasure? It gives you brand new life. Because I believe this. You can't change yourself. I can't change me. But God can. But he never does it without me. He will only do it with me. And what I mean by that is this. You might not have the power to change you. But God does not come in and kick in the door of your life and say, I'm going to change you whether you like it or not. No, he works with you. He wants your life and your heart, your desires for things, your habits to be transformed. And so he offers us new life. That's one of the things that's so great about the kingdom of God. Um, here's the fourth thing. And can I warn you right now? Nobody ever likes to hear about the fourth thing. But here it is. The gospel is a treasure because it offers us rescue. Here it is. God rescues us from an eternity of pain, sadness, and separation from him. Um, I'm going to say it this way. What I'm about to read to you, most Christians avoid. They don't want to hear it. And, and here's why. And for some of them, rightfully so. Because years ago, um, this was used to fear monger. The, what I'm about to read to you is, is something that pastors used to use or other Christians used to use to create fear in people's lives. So, oh my gosh, I'm so scared. I'll, I'll, I'll do anything. Let me tell you the story. Ready? There's first the parable about this treasure hidden in a field. Then there's a story about a pearl that this merchant was searching for. And then Jesus tells this next parable. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let, let down into the lake. And it caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on shore. Then they sat down and they collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad ones away. What's the difference between a good fish and a bad fish? You, you and I, you know, we're probably not going to be able to know that, but a first century Jewish person in Jesus' audience, everybody knew what an acceptable good fish was and what a bad fish was. In the Old Testament, God said, here's, here's what you eat. You eat the fish with scales. Because they ain't bottom feeders, they're good, and they eat the fish with scales. Uh, so, by the way, Jewish first century, never, never had a catfish fry. No scales on that guy. And, and so you, you have these two fish. Everybody in the first century would know these are good fish, these are bad fish. So, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. He doesn't leave us guessing what are the good fish, what are the bad fish. Listen to how this story goes. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I told you, nobody wants to hear this. But we have to hear this and understand it because it's part of the treasure of the kingdom of God. In the future, angels will come and separate the good people from the bad people. Now remember this, what makes people good? I mean, throughout the scriptures, it is not those who behave, who follow the religious traditions, who, who do everything right. Good people are those who have received forgiveness and relationship with God based off of Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross for us. Amen? You have to understand that if you're going to understand this story. 
If not, it sounds like, oh my gosh, there's some good people who do good things and there's some bad people who do some bad things. And, like, and you never know, am I worse than the people around me? You can always find people who are worse than you, but guess what? You can throw a rock and hit a bunch of people who behave way better than you do. And so we're left guessing, am I good or am I bad? You don't have to guess at whether you're a part of God's family or not. The author of the book of John wrote, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you know that you know that you know that you have eternal life. You don't have to guess. And this is the reality. Those people who refuse to receive forgiveness from Jesus, here's what it is, they will be thrown to eternal separation from God and eternal separation from Jesus. And in multiple places in the Gospels, Jesus says it this way. The place where they're going is weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a sad place. It's a tormenting place. It's a place where the the gnashing of teeth is the kind of pain, like, that's how he describes this situation. By the way, it's interesting, in Matthew chapter 13, if you just read the whole chapter through, there's seven parables. You get these two parables, and then you get a third parable that's essentially the same thing as this, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then you get parables four and five, which is the parable of the the treasure, the hidden treasure, and then this parable of the, the pearl, and then the sixth one is this parable about weeping and gnashing of teeth. Two parables in the same kind of sequence, number three and number six. Matthew's trying to make a point. That one of the unbelievably great things about the kingdom of God, the treasure of it, is what it rescues us from. I've had a lot of people tell me, when I, when I tell them I'm Christian and they don't understand like, what the Christian faith really is, they just say this, often they'll say, do you believe in hell? Like, is there a hell? Well, yes, I do, because of stuff like this. Jesus, the one who died on the cross, predicted his own resurrection and then pulled it off. Like, I trust what he says about stuff more than anybody else. Because he had unbelievable power. Um, if he's going to talk about it, then yes, I do believe that there's a hell. And then I have people that will tell me this. Well, you know what? My grandpa, he was the most important person in my life. And I don't think my grandpa followed Jesus. And so listen, I'd rather be in hell with my grandpa than in heaven without him. Okay, let me speak to this for just a moment. I don't get to look at anybody else and say, you're going to hell. All I can do is point to the scriptures and say, I I can tell you what the features are so that you are in the kingdom of God. And I can tell you what they are to keep you out of the kingdom of God. I never met your grandpa. I don't know if in the final moments of his life that He's like, I, I know I'm lost, and Jesus, yes, I need you, and he cries out to God. I don't know if he did that. So I would never tell somebody, yep, for sure your grandpa's in hell. But then I ask him this. What if your grandpa, let's just say he is in hell, what if he could speak to you from there? Guaranteed he's not going to say, come on down, join me. If he loves you. And it's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. What he would tell you is, son, I was wrong. Jesus is it. That's the treasure. That's forgiveness. That is where love and relationship with God count. That is the new life. And that, is, that rescues us. Jesus rescues us from the torment I have. I think that's what your grandpa would say. But this is one of those really tough passages because I guarantee this, if you're a follower of Christ, you probably have family and friends who don't yet know Christ and probably some who have already died. And you're like, I I, I don't know, maybe they have gone there and they're eternally separated from God. Really, that's, this is just one of the realities that Jesus puts a line in the sand and says, this is my family and I welcome you, join it, but there's going to be some people who refuse it. It's a really hard teaching from Scripture and I understand there have been pastors who've like tried to fear monger that and I'm not doing that at all. But I will not back down from the truth that Jesus is teaching in a parable because it makes people uncomfortable. I think Jesus wanted to make people uncomfortable. My daughter a couple weeks ago, she went to a Rascal Flats concert in Shoreline. Anybody else there? I know some of you are like, I don't know if I can say I was at a Rascal Flats concert. And this is church, right? Um, so they were walking in. And she's got some friends with her. Her friends are not 
Christian, um, but she's building relationship and sharing truth, and they've had some great discussions kind of recently where they're all walking into the concert, and there's people on the corner that are waiting for them before they walk in that are just yelling at them, you're going to hell! Really? Okay, thank you. You have a good day. You're going to hell! Like, that's what they were doing. She's bummed. She's like, man, I've been trying to help my friends understand who God is and all of this, you know, the kingdom of God and that, that it, it's forgiveness. It is loved by God, but there's also this rescuing from hell. And during the concert, um, the, the lead vocalist, uh, his name is Gary LaVox, which is weird. I always thought the lead vocalist of Rascal Flats was named Rascal Flats. <laughs> I don't know. My bad. Um, he said, hey, how many of you, when you came into the concert tonight, you were told you're going to hell, and boom, the crowd, yeah! Like, I don't think they were cheering for hell. I think they were cheering against people who were just super confrontational towards them. And in just a few sentences, he said, well, tell you what, tonight let's turn that all around. And I want you to listen to this song, because all of us have walked a broken road. And he sings this song. Um, the lyrics go like this. I set out on a narrow way many years ago, hoping I would find true love along the broken road. But I got lost a time or two, wiped my brow and kept pushing through. I couldn't see how every sign pointed straight to you. That every long lost dream led me to where you are. Others who broke my heart, they were like northern stars pointing me on my way into your loving arms. This much I know is true, that God blessed the broken road that led me straight to you. And I know that there's some people who go, yeah, see, it's about, I had all these bad relationships before, and now I found the woman of my dreams or the man of my dreams. Like, okay, maybe that, you go with that. I think the truth of this, whether they intended that uh, or not in this song, is that all of us lived a broken life and walked along a broken road. And it's moments like this where we read a parable and a story about the unbelievable value of the kingdom of God. And it strikes us that, ah, oh, I could be forgiven. I don't have to carry that load anymore. I could have a real, honest, authentic relationship with God where I don't have to hide from him anymore. God will start working in me to give me a new life, one that I've always wanted and longed for but didn't have. That broken life I used to have and the people that I've broken or that have broken me along the way, now I can have it new. I'll say yes to that Jesus every time. And maybe it's your brokenness that brought you to church today. And it's time to say yes to Jesus. Hey, spoiler alert. The Global Leadership Summit this next Thursday and Friday right here at our church. This is a conference that takes place in Chicago. And they televise it 300 plus locations all around North America. You know who's going to be there? Gary LaVox from Rascal Flats. I hope he sings this song. So what do you want to do with this? What I love about this parable is that all he tells us is, I just want you to understand, there's an unbelievable value to the kingdom of God. And I just tried to put my finger on, see, the disciples, when he told this story, they didn't yet know about the cross and the resurrection. So you and I can go in and backfill this story with what's so valuable about the kingdom of God. And hopefully you got it today. Forgiveness, love, a relationship with God, new life, and it rescues us from hell. And maybe today's the day that you're going to say, I want it. I know I need it, but I want it from this day forward. I'm going to become a Christian. I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And if that's something you want to do, then do it today and do it now. And when you're a Christian, you can always join us. Take up the bread and the cup. and This bread symbolizes his body. Eat it in remembrance of what he's done for you and drink. And show gratitude for that. And so here's how we do this. There's nothing magical about this, but I'm just going to pray a prayer. If this is, you want to give your life to Christ, then do it today, all right? You don't have to pray my words. You pray your own words if you want, but it's going to sound probably something pretty similar. And so let's bow our heads. Let's pray. For anybody who wants to, I'm going to invite you just to pray right now. By the way, I'm not going to bring you up front, embarrass you, parade you around. This is between you and God at this moment because this is personal. Let's pray. God, I believe Jesus is your son who came to earth. He died on a cross as a payment for my sins. God, today, I accept and receive your forgiveness. 
I leave the weight of my brokenness behind. I leave the weight of my bad decisions behind. I leave the weight of my regrets behind. God, I accept your generous friendship today. And I ask that, God, today you would start working in my heart to change me, change my character, change my desires, the things that I long for that harm me, that are not helpful for me. And, God, I want relationship with you. And in eternity, I trust that I will be with you forever. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.